Thank you so much to the High Representative for those remarks uh, and for, for joining us uh, here and this morning. I think to me, uh, what, what really jumped out was the necessity of complementing soft power with hard power and the evolution of European foreign policy. And we now have a really terrific conversation uh, to follow that. So we will be uh, joined by my colleague, uh, John Allen, who is president of the Brookings Institution, and he will interview uh, Mircha Juana, who is the Deputy Secretary General of NATO. Uh, Mr. Juana served in previous uh, senior positions for the Romanian government, and he is the first uh, senior official in NATO, the first Deputy Secretary General from one of the countries that joined after the end of the Cold War. So we are particularly uh, delighted that he can uh, join us this morning. Um, so with that, John, uh, may I pass it over to you? Thank you, Tom. And Dervla, <clears throat> thank you very much. And my sincere thanks to the High Representative for those marvelous uh, contextual remarks that sets the day off so well. But now we turn to NATO. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, it's wonderful to be with you again today. It's a great pleasure for me to have the honor of uh, introducing our first panel and our distinguished guest, the NATO Deputy Secretary General, Mircea Joana. Appointed to his current role in October 2019, Deputy Secretary General Joanna has long advocated for the transatlantic bond and the importance of the NATO alliance. Both as a seasoned diplomat and statesman, he spent his career representing his country, Romania. Among his many accomplishments includes serving as the chairperson in office of the Organization of the, for Security and Cooperation in Europe, as well as a member of the Romanian delegation to the NATO parliament parliamentary uh, assembly. He's been made not only a commander of the national order of the star of Romania, but also holds the distinction of the French Légion d'honneur and the <clears throat> Italian Stella de Solidarité. We are honored to have you with us today, sir. And we'll go for about 30 minutes, concluding this interview and the questions at <clears throat> 45 minutes uh, after the hour. So thank you very much for joining us today. Deputy Secretary. Um, sir, my first question is that, that Secretary General uh, Jan Stoltenberg announced in the, the NATO 2030 initiative, and it's aimed to make NATO, quote, strong, stay strong militarily, but more united politically and take a broader approach globally. NATO 2030 promises to prepare the alliance for challenges of the coming future. Uh, Mr. Secretary, Deputy Secretary General, could you please describe what those challenges are and how the NATO-EU cooperation fits into the 2030 vision? Uh, General Allen, uh, the pleasure and honor is all mine. Uh, you have here in NATO uh, and all over the world a remar remarkable reputation, and we owe you a great debt of gratitude for what you have done for us leading NATO and American forces in Afghanistan, transforming them into, uh, for a different role. Uh, you, we owe you a great debt of gratitude, sir. So uh, here in NATO, uh, you're home. Now, I listened to, uh, to Joseph Borrell with great attention, and um, um, it was a little bit uh, intense uh, when he said that Europe, European Union, um, because he's representing European Union foreign policy, and security has stopped being naive. I think all of us, after the fall of communism, believed that the defeat of Soviet Union, the demise of, uh, of the Soviet-style communism, would be somehow the end of history. We all believed that we'll be enjoying liberal democracy, freedom, uh, and an ever-expanding world of harmony. But history is a, is a, is a tough teacher. And we, heard, we, we learned the hard way that history never stops, that global competition never stops. And now we are at the critical moment of world history. I would say just one word on it comes for NATO and EU. There is no way, but no way, neither for Europe nor for our friends in North America, US and Canada, our, our dearest allies, for us to cope with the changes in the world alone. Together, EUS and Canada and the European allies, we still represent 50% of global GDP. We still represent, um, and we represent 1 billion people. 
Speaking of technology, and I'm, I'm reading with great interest, uh, General Allen, uh, what you're writing on AI, on, on these kind of things. 30, 28 of the, the first 30 universities in the world are still in, Western, in, in, in the Western world. Open societies are more conducive for innovation and, 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 and freedom. I strongly believe, coming from Romania, that is the essential ingredient for success. And if we add, speaking of NATO this time, the 40s, the 40 something partners that we have, also in the Asia Pacific, with Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and South Korea, the many partners we have in the Gulf, in the Middle East, even in, in, in Latin America, in Colombia, I think that this political West is something that we have to keep together. Because if not, it will be very difficult, even for the US, which continues to be the leading nation in the world, continues to be, despite difficulties, that we are seeing you know, in, uh, in, in these recent uh, weeks and months. Um, we cannot do it alone. So when uh, Borrell, uh, Jose Borrell, whom I know for many, many years and decades, also as former foreign minister of Romania, former ambassador to Washington, by the way, when I learned the ropes of American uh, politics and, and diplomacy, when he said that Europe is stopping being naive, I also say uh, that there is no way for Europe alone without our friends in America and, and for the other allies in Europe that are not EU members. If we look at the numbers of defense spending today, the non-EU non members of NATO are investing 80% of the total defense spending in the alliance, 80%, 8-0. Because we have now the UK outside of the EU, we have Norway, the country of my boss, Jens Stoltenberg, we have Turkey, we have many other nations that are not uh, part of the EU. So, where also I, will, I would like to say one word. I think that not only this pandemic, but the recent, if you want, two decades or so, from 9-11 on, also showed us that it's not only about hard and soft power. It's about a broader definition of security. And we're speaking in NATO in a different jargon, because that's our, that's our um, codified way of speaking, of non-military means of power. Without strong, credible defense, without strong, credible innovation, without cre strong military and intelligence, you just cannot work only with the other tools of power. But I think that also, more and more, we see that this pandemic show that we need investment in resources. We have to rethink global supply chains. And this is where I think NATO continues to be the cornerstone, not only of transatlantic security, but an indispensable part of global order. And American leadership is needed. And American leadership is something that is, uh, you know, our strong interest. And also, I think, uh, a strong US and North America uh, European cooperation is paramount for the interest of all of us, Europeans and North Americans, and freedom lovers and democracy believers all over the world. Thank you, Deputy Secretary General. That was a tremendous answer. You know, we're facing, as you have mentioned, and as the EU High Representative mentioned, we're facing the dilemma of the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, it's infected millions, it has killed hundreds of thousands, and it has devastated economies around the world, almost to a level in the United States, in any case, of the era of the Great Depression. And what it has done in many respects, it has caused nations to retract in their thinking orienting on the domestic challenges that they face, and often the issues of foreign policy have ceased to dominate their thinking. So at a moment like this, an international organization such as NATO is of extreme value, I think. And, and how do you, how would you imagine that NATO can be of value to the broader community of nations during this global pandemic, sir? Thank you, General. That, that's, that's, a, that's a critical question. And I do believe that one thing we should do together uh, this community of democracies, these this nations of ours, is to make sure that the lessons learned from the pandemic, but also the lessons unlearned from previous difficult moments, should not lead to further divergence across the Atlantic. I think we have to really think hard. And, and, and also, uh, would sometimes even with real politique, not only with naive, uh, as uh, Jose Borrell was mentioning, but in real terms. And we have to think hard and making sure that we, 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 we realize that only, only putting our resources together, we can be strong. Where NATO has done a tremendous job, and I think we are 
the leading organization, I, I, would, I would dare say globally, is on resilience. Because now we, resilience has become the buzzword of the moment. Everybody speaks about resilience. But since the Warsaw NATO summit, you remember the summit in Warsaw, which was a pretty successful one, the leaders of the alliance uh, decided that NATO should strengthen our, what we call in our jargon again, the baseline requirements for resilience. Seven fields from infrastructure to energy to civil military emergency, all these kind of things. Defense ministers of NATO just two weeks ago, where Josep Borrell uh, participated, when the defense ministers of Sweden and Finland, one of the closest partners of NATO in the EU, participated. And for the first time, the lady defense minister of Australia took part in a defense ministerial of NATO. And we upgraded the baseline requirements for resilience. This is what we are offering our EU colleagues and friends as we speak. Because also in the EU, the lessons learned are showing to them that resilience is a subject of interest also to the EU. EU is not a defense alliance. It's a different kind of multilateral institution. So they're looking probably in a complementary way with, with us to supply chains, to uh, healthcare chains, things that are more of an economic and business nature rather than the ones that are rel relatively, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a narrow sense, uh, security from a NATO standpoint. So from the 74 common actions that NATO and EU are currently doing, and the report jointly presented by Jens Stoltenberg and Josep Borrell just a few weeks ago, we could really put lessons learned and resilience as a complementary toolbox, and then reach out to our friends and partners from all over the world, democratic partners. I think Japan and Australia, New Zealand and South Korea, I'm mentioning the Asia Pacific countries. So this is where I believe we have to make sure that the introspective way of looking at things, the national, uh, let's say, interest, which is ref reflected by, by leaders all over the world, is not leading to further disaggregation of our, uh, of our uh, community of democracies. So I believe the lessons learned in resilience could be a, a very practical tool, because all of us, from America to Canada and from Romania all the way to Norway, uh, all of us, all national governments, need to cope with this kind of thing. And this is where NATO, I think, could be an exceptionally useful uh, organization, and our uh, skill set, uh, together with the EU and together with national instruments, could really be of great help to, to nations. That was a tremendous answer, and you, you made the point about uh, we are seeing a moment of divergence, and NATO really does have the capacity with that toolbox of capabilities, <clears throat> not just to build in resilience in whatever follows COVID, but also to reverse divergence and create unification of the community of democracies. It's a tremendous point. Now, NATO's success has been because of the shared understanding of its demo of democratic values. And unfortunately, questions uh, arise of burden sharing, and they often overshadow that mutual understanding and has been pushed by many, including President Trump, uh, to take dramatic steps uh, to force the issue at hand. Uh, Mr. Deputy Secretary General, how can NATO encourage allies to be more proactive for their defense spending while still advancing our same mission? General, you, you, you know this better than I do. I remember uh, in my career and listening and also sometimes physically seeing American presidents from President Clinton to President G.W. Bush to President Obama and now to President Trump and then whoever the American people will decide to, 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 to put in the White House, that every single American president and American leadership has asked European allies to step up our game. And I think this is something that we need. And this is not just a sort of a favor, uh, a sort of a... Uh, thing that we do just to please the, uh, the person that is in the White House at a certain moment in, in American history and, and, and political cycles. This is also for our own interest. Now, I'm, I'm heartened to see that despite this economic downturn and the difficult choices that leaders need to take in their national capacity, we are seeing more and more allies reconfirming the target of 2%. My country, Romania, has put in the national security strategy. Uh, the UK has reconfirmed this recently. I was taking part in a webinar with our friends from Central Europe, and I, I heard in a, in a similar conversation the, the Czech Prime Minister reconfirming the target for 2%. Now, 
Inside the 2%, the question is, and this is where we need the, 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 the experience of people like you, uh, General, and many others, is how to spend the 2% better. How to, to make sure that we transform uh, uh, the way in which we are preparing for the warfare of tomorrow. Speaking of several general in NATO 2030, how we remain strong militarily, because also things are changing. Also, the lessons learned that I mentioned earlier could be a way for us to start spending uh, more and smarter into, into defense. So I do believe that this thing of burden sharing that has, in, in a way, uh, be seen sometimes in a more narrow way, in fact, is the foundation for the transatlantic unity and also for something that our military commanders and our uh, men and women in uniform, whom we respect and we admire and we, 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 we always show our gratitude, this is about interoperability. Just making sure that big allies like the US will be able to continue to fight with smaller allies with smaller resources in the, God forbid, the, the, the worst of tomorrow. So this is why I believe the 2%, the burden sharing thing, is more than just the 2% figure, which is important. And it's, it's indicative of a certain political will. But the, the real question is, how do we spend better? How can we put the, the public money and, and the taxpayers' money into better, uh, uh, let's say, uh, usage? And also, how can we incorporate the lessons learned uh, uh, from this pandemic and also from a changing world. I'm, 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 I strongly believe that allies will continue to invest in defense and security just because security has become more complicated with the pandemic. Things are the same. Russia is uh, uh, ever more aggressive. China is coming up. We have things all over us that are complicated. Competition in space is increasing. And new technologies are accelerating a, a shift in global power. So we just cannot afford not to invest in our defense. That's the precondition for peace, General Allen. And you know this better than anybody else. And that's why I believe that uh, NATO will continue to invest in defense and nations will continue to understand that this is the best interest uh, individually and collectively. I hope everybody was listening very closely to that answer because it couldn't have been better. The whole idea of spending on modernization and investing in the new technologies will be what keeps NATO strong and interoperable. Uh, Mr. Sec Deputy Secretary General, thank you, sir. Great answer. Let me ask, a, it, it's, a, it's a more pointed uh, regional question, but I think it speaks to a larger issue. You know, we've had some reports recently of uh, Russian-backed Taliban stalking uh, American troops uh, in Afghanistan, and it's left many skeptical uh, of the recent Afghan negotiations for peace. Moreover, the scheduled withdrawal of U.S. troops from the region leaves questions of the future of that country unanswered. Sir, what are your thoughts? What does NATO anticipate uh, as its role in Afghanistan going forward? And how does that square with the NATO 2030 initiative? General, you, you know Afghanistan better than any, any one of us, and you've been leading the U.S. forces and also the NATO forces in ISAF uh, a few years ago. So I have to say that I'm exceptionally proud uh, of the incredible unity that not only NATO, but also our global partners from all over the world uh, has shown, they have shown uh, to our commitment uh, to Afghanistan. Of course, uh, the announcements coming about, uh, let's say, a gradual uh, uh, downsizing of American presence creates, the US is the backbone of, of, of the whole operation. But I have to say that we had just last Friday, I think, just a few days ago, we had a meeting here in NATO, and also uh, several generals Stoddard met with, with Secretary Esper. Uh, General Miller, one of your successors, uh, was here. Uh, Ambassador Halizad, who's doing an incredible job in, in, in trying to bring inter-Afghan talks uh, to, to a better uh, outcome. And I have to say that it was NATO and partners, and there was basically absolutely no indication of a lessening of the commitment of the whole alliance and our global partners to the future of Afghanistan. It's not going to be easy. For the time being, we stay with the uh, announcement of American uh, downsizing into the current posture, speaking of NATO. Of course, our military commanders, you know this very well, are planning ahead. We are also trying to help directly and indirectly the inter-Afghan talks. And also something that we've been doing, and I've been doing personally in, in a very intense way, is to making sure that we also talk 
to the rest of the international community that uh, has an interest and in also investing money into the economic and humanitarian development in Afghanistan. So as we speak, NATO, EU, UN, the World Bank, the international donors, we are working to a set of conditions that will be both conducive uh, for inter-Afghan negotiations, but also making sure that when we'll be uh, uh, in a different uh, military posture in Afghanistan, that we find the means uh, to keep this country safe. And I'm also saying something, speaking of Russia and even China and other regional players around Afghanistan. That's a, that's a tough thing. But an Afghanistan that is stabilized and is also becoming part of the global international community and, 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 and an economic player is also good for, for these countries because they have experience. That's, that's, that's critical for the peace and stability in Eurasia. So this is why we are calling also on the other players who are not with us in NATO, not our partners uh, uh, in, in this great, al almost more than two decades coalition of nations for, for Afghanistan to stay the course because a stable Afghanistan is not only good for NATO, for the US, it's also good for Russia, China, and also Pakistan uh, or other regional players. And, and let me, if I may, just take a second and say as the former commander, of the NATO forces in Afghanistan, how proud every NATO member should be of the performance of their magnificent troops on the ground in Afghanistan. Uh, it is something that I think the coalition should be deeply proud of, and the members of the NATO alliance individually should be deeply proud of how their troops performed both as individual soldiers, but also as, a, as an entity, as NATO, as a command. And I'd also like to say that one of, the, one of my greatest partners while I was the commander was the EU. And so this was a real opportunity to see NATO in action with a deep partnership of the EU at the very edge of conflict. And uh, it was a wonderful thing to see, Mr. Deputy Secretary General. General, let me also sure. echo what you have said. There is nothing, uh, there's no word that can describe the gratitude for the sacrifice and courage of our military uh, personnel in Afghanistan and all, all over the world. I think the people at home sometimes don't, do not realize uh, how much we owe as civilians, as normal citizens, uh, to our military uh, people. And, and uh, I, I echo what you have said uh, with, the same, uh, with the same intensity and the same sense of gratitude. Thank you, sir. Thank you. In recent months, there have been some instances of impressive uh, coordination amongst uh, between uh, NATO and the EU, uh, the allies, of course. And we've also seen internal tensions, though, uh, for example, between France and Turkey in the Mediterranean. And this dispute has led France to suspend its participation in NATO's Operation Sea Guardian. How can NATO ensure that internal disputes do not impede the ability of our allies to work towards shared goals? And, and what should NATO's role be when allies violate those rules and the principles of the alliance. General Allen, let me, let me start with one, let's say, new or relatively new uh, area where NATO and, and the EU and also other global players, G7, the UN and others we've been working together is in fighting disinformation and, and uh, these, these counter narratives that countries like Russia or China or non-state actors, Iran also, uh, uh, abusing of this pandemic to, to, to basically put a seed of discord within democratic societies. And NATO and EU have been working exceptionally closely together in, in fighting this thing. I'm coming back to your, to your question, which is always um, uh, the political question. How can we, inside NATO and inside the, uh, the, the uh, system of global democracies, uh, cope with the tension between two members of the same alliance that have different interests and views on one specific point, which is the case in point, let's say, in Libya. You mentioned this, this thing. It's not only Turkey and France that have uh, uh, interests that are, uh, are, are divergent. We also see with great con grave concern Russia, directly and indirectly, meddling also into the Western Mediterranean after having a stronger uh, footprint in Syria, in the Eastern Mediterranean. So what we are trying to do, and this is what also Secretary General Stoltenberg has, has been doing, all of us have been doing, is to making sure that, number one, we try through political dialogue and openness and frankness sometimes 
to prevent such situations from occurring. And then if, God forbid, they do occur because life is tough and uh, not every time 30 nations can uh, see eye to eye, the situations when they don't see eye to eye, to also use the political uh, uh, strengthened value of NATO, which is in NATO 2030, to do this. As we speak, our military uh, 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 professionals have been looking and have issued a report about the incident which was reported. We are trying to find a way and also making sure that these things do not happen. Because uh, um, uh, sometimes it's not easy for us as an international organization working by consensus. Uh, you know the Washington Treaty, our, uh, let's say our foundation that speaks about values of rule of, rule of law, democracy and, uh, and freedom. Um, we are not in the business of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, telling one ally or the other uh, how, to, how to behave, but we are trying our best, and we need the support of capitals, of ally nations, to making sure that we keep NATO strong militarily, politically, and also adapting to a changing world. Well, uh, to that very end, uh, Defender Europe 20, uh, it was set to be one of the largest American military exercises in Europe since the end of the Cold War. And it evolved, uh, and it involved extensive uh, EU, NATO, and U.S. cooperation. However, the exercise, as you know, Deputy Secretary General, was scaled down dramatically uh, due to COVID-19 concerns. So with that as context, how do we have to think in the future about our model of cooperation for NATO and the EU and the U.S.? How do we evolve our responses to these kinds of challenges, to the new reality that we'll face uh, as we continue to deal with uh, this pandemic and other security threats such as cyber attacks and the strategic influence operations that we have seen being wielded uh, against our democracies? How, as we go forward in the future, do we need to be thinking about this model of NATO, EU, US cooperation going forward, sir? Let me uh, give you another uh, indication of the intimacy between NATO and EU, uh, also with another number. It's a st statistic, but it's relevant. We have today 22 countries, nations, that are both NATO allies and member states of the European Union. 90%, 90% of the population of the EU today, in 27, without the UK, are also part of the NATO alliance. So what we are trying to do, and this is what we are doing, is making sure that we stay convergent in analyzing threats uh, to, all of, to, to all of us. What NATO has been doing, and this is a process that we applaud, as we applaud the determination of the United States to continue to invest in real terms uh, into the security of Europe. Defender, uh, Defender Europe 2020 was downsized because of the pandemic. But the very intention to do such a massive uh, display of interest and support for Europe is, is as strong as the exercise uh, not being uh, downsized. We also see the US leading battle groups in the Baltics. They are present in my country, Romania. They are present in Spain. That's many other things that, 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 that are, are showing this commitment. What we have launched, and our defense ministers approved, and our chiefs of defense also had a big role, and Sakhir, uh, and our uh, uh, commander for transformation in Ofol, General Lanata and, and General Walters, we are working now on a new concept, which is called deterrence and defense for the Euro-Atlantic area, which is the first comprehensive, all domain, all directions, 360, including space, including hybrid, including cyber, including, uh, let's say, uh, new technologies, more traditional threats. And this is something that will be transferred into the operation way in which both NATO and also this is something we lend to our EU friends, will be, I think, uh, in a way, uh, speaking of uh, being naive, will be not a great idea to duplicate. If NATO is good at doing something, I believe that the EU should be do, doing things complementary to what we do. So I'm confident, and we are confident here at the NATO headquarters, um, that uh, we take, like always, in the last 71 years of uh, existence of our great alliance, threats old, new, and future ones very seriously. And this body of expertise, this fantastic capacity of our military people to work together 
um, is also an encouragement for the EU uh, to step up their game, to continue to invest in defense, and also making sure that across the Atlantic, uh, we stay strong and also we cope with any crisis. Because as I mentioned at the beginning, history never stops. And global competition uh, is raging. Uh, and the rise of China is also a fact. And there, uh, 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 a, a, a Russia that is trying to, to, to use and abuse of some of its instruments of power to disrupt uh, uh, the political West is something that we have to take into account. So yeah, um, uh, not always easy, uh, but I think we have a sense uh, of a common understanding uh, of the threats and the strategic culture across the Atlantic uh, is also becoming far more modern and also far more uh, uh, global, if you want. Well, Deputy Secretary General Joanna, it was a real honor to have the opportunity to speak with you this morning. These answers uh, were a true tour de force uh, of what NATO stands for, what NATO has done for our peace and security. But I think more importantly, you've given us a glimpse into what NATO will do in the future for all of us. It is a global uh, entity that will have effect for many years to come. We're so grateful for your service as the Deputy Secretary General and for the role that NATO plays now in cooperation with the EU and certainly with the United States. And I want to thank you for your time this morning. Uh, very, very greatly thank you for your time this morning. And let me now, if I may, uh, turn it back over to Tom and Dervla.